I've got to make a trip to Tennessee here. Uh, okay, I'm always impressed with Dr. Matthews' ability to get other faculty to come teach his classes. <laughs> and anyway, uh, he's, he's a wonderful asset to the university, and we are glad to have him here. But I appreciate his invitation to come and talk to you today about this. We're talking about the geography of the land of Canaan. And I've tried to use a, a term that's somewhat neutral here. Politically, there's a lot of volatility that involved in using this term, or not so much this term as it is the term Palestine or Israel, because it tends to go into modern political dispute with the Palestinians and Israelis. And so sort of a more neutral term to use to refer to all of this is the land of Canaan. And so I've chosen this as the, the term to utilize, at least in part of the discussion. Now, as I proceed, I will use the word Palestine and Israel sort of interchangeably, and so be aware of that. But formally, this is the direction we're going to go here. Now, one of the things that's important to realize is that events in our lives occur inevitably within geographical context. We cannot escape that. I mean, we, since we live and move in a three-dimensional world, uh, then those geographical locations where we live will inevitably mold how we do things and how we think. Uh, if you live in an area that's very arid and dry, then the lifestyle that you per pursue will be very different than if you live in an area where there's a lot of rainfall. So irrigation will tend to characterize the dry, arid regions if there are water resources anywhere in the vicinity, whereas if you live in an area where there's a lot of rain, you don't have to worry about irrigation. You just deal with the rainfall as it comes, pray that there's sufficient rain, pray that there isn't too much rain, and all of those kinds of things. But these will affect how people behave and interact with their environment. They also will have an impact on building materials. If you live in an area, for instance, that uh, doesn't have a lot of trees, you'll tend usually to build your houses and structures out of either stone or mud brick or something that b building material that's in the vicinity. Now today in our modern world, we have a tendency to import and move things around, you know, on trains and trucks and all of that kind of thing. But in the ancient world, that wasn't quite so easy. And as we look at the land of Israel, Mesopotamia, and Egypt, certainly the natural resource issue is going to come into the picture that's very, very different than what most of us, at least in the United States, are accustomed to, especially those who live in the eastern United States. Furthermore, as we look at these issues, we're looking at mountains, water resources, soil productivity, uh, minerals, precious metals, and so forth that are available. Now, even early in the history of humanity, they became aware of widespread distribution of minerals and precious metals. Now, these, of course, will be exported and transported over long distance, and often thousands of miles in the ancient world. Now, certainly today we do the st same kind of thing, but most of us don't think a whole lot about the mechanics of getting it from point A to point B because it's so common, at least here in the U.S. But again, as we're looking at this issue of geography, these are some of the factors that play into the determination of where people are going to live, how they're going to conduct themselves, and to a large extent, even some of their religious beliefs will be colored by what is going on in the world around them and their, you know, their own constructs of world views and so forth. Now we're going to start very briefly with the area of Mesopotamia. The term Mesopotamia means between the rivers and the reference is to the rivers Euphrates and Tigris. These are the two defining factors of what the between the rivers is. Now Tracing this from the Persian Gulf over here on the lower right-hand side, the Euphrates comes up this direction and goes over here near the area of the northwest, northeastern part of the Levant and then curves back into the interior of Turkey. The Tigris will come and follow roughly the same route, but then it will go on the eastern edge up into what we would call central Turkey. Now these are the two rivers that are alluded to when the term Mesopotamia occurs. Now, Mesopotamia is a Greek word. In the ancient world, the term would be Aram Naharayim, or Aram of the two rivers, and more specifically refers to the area up here. But uh, the term has sort of morphed through time and so forth, and when the Greeks come through, they refer to it as Mesopotamia. And obviously, if we think in terms of land between the two rivers, it will involve some land on each side beyond that, as particularly you deal with where people live and irrigation procedures and so forth. But these are critically important. This is sometimes referred to as the cradle of civilization. 
some of the earliest civilizations develop in this region just prior, of course this is argued by Egyptologists, but just prior to the Egyptians and their emergence and so forth. Uh, I have a tendency to give Mesopotamia supremacy over the development of civilization, but uh, what do I know? Uh, the Mesopotamian basin is usually considered about 600 miles long, uh, extending from the Persian Gulf, going up basically in a northwesterly direction. Much of it is alluvial, especially as the soil comes down out of the mountainous areas, as indicated sort of on this relief map. And you'll notice then it becomes fairly smooth down here with wide swashes of green. And this is the, the, the soil cascading down out of the mountains and then spreading out over this alluvial area. And hence the area is quite rich as far as agriculture is concerned. And farming developed along this area very significantly. The Mesopotamian basin is hemmed in on mountains on the east, the Zagros over here. Uh, mountains on the north, the Urartian Mountains, and then on the southwest there are, there's the desert, and of course the Persian Gulf serves as a barrier on the southeast section. So this area is, they don't have to worry too much about folks invading from the middle of Saudi Arabia, what we would call Saudi Arabia, because basically nobody lives there. And they don't have to worry too much about folks invading from the Persian Gulf because, at least for the folks that live down here in Babylonia, they essentially control that. The Assyrians, on the other hand, who are going to have their capital at Nineveh, are landlocked and they are then pressured from all directions, from the Babylonians to the south, the Assyrians to the west, the Hittites sort of to the northwest, and the Urartians to the north, and the Persians, what would eventually become the Persians from the east, and so the Assyrians are sort of open to all kinds of mess, but the Babylonians at least have fewer flanks to have to worry with. Now, let me, just a minute. Along the way here, this is sometimes referred to as the Fertile Crescent, as you would come up from the Persian Gulf in a northeast, northwesterly direction, curving along the Levantine coast and going down along the eastern Mediterranean. This little section right here is basically the focal point that we're going to deal with from this point on in our discussion. This is a land bridge, for lack of a better term, between Mesopotamia and Egypt. Of course, two major, major civilizational developments in the ancient world. And the traffic, as they would pass through here, would almost inevitably go through this little narrow neck of land. And we're going to talk about the significance of how narrow this neck of land is. Uh, there might be some sailing around the peninsula of, of, of the Arabia, uh, but that is a long distance because it would go way down here and come back up this direction. It's much shorter to go this route, but then on the other hand, it has its own hazards with which to deal. Now, most of the people in the ancient world, if they were going to go over here into Turkey, they would also travel along this way rather than sailing straight across. There isn't a whole lot of evidence of sailing straight across from here to uh, Turkey and Anatolia. The evidence from the ancient world tends generally to be sort of sailing along the coast and stopping at different places along the way. And hence, again, the, the Levantine coast serves as the anchorage as people would make that trip northward. Now, admittedly, the evidence for sailing directly across there is minimal because Lot, not much has really been done archaeologically at the ocean floor here because it's so deep. But moving into the area of Syrian Palestine, and looking now more specifically for the remainder of the discussion this afternoon, at this area. This is the region of Palestine in particular, of land of Canaan. Syria technically is the area to the north of Mount Hermon, which is the uh, snow-capped mountain here on the uh, lower right-hand map. And as we look at this, again, to emphasize, this little area is the land bridge between Asia, Africa, and Europe. Now, there's a little bit of occupation that goes over into Transjordan or modern Jordan today, but it's fairly limited, although significant. I don't want to trivialize and minimize it. But Africa would be down to the southwest. Uh, Europe, would, of course, would be further up to the northwest. And then, of course, Asia... Actually, technically, Palestine, Canaan is in Asia. Uh, and uh, then there would be the traffic going on toward India and so forth. Now, the area is approximately 400 miles long along the eastern Mediterranean coast. 
and some other terms that will apply to this. And it's very important that you be aware of this in the literature because they will often use the terms interchangeably, although there may be occasions they'll define them more specifically. But other terms that apply are the term Levant, and occasionally you'll hear people refer to the Levantine coast. They're referring to the coastline that goes along here on the eastern Mediterranean area. Sometimes it's referred to as the Near East. Uh, hit the button too quickly. It's also referred to as the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, the division that usually occurs is, again, north of this would be Syria, and south of this would be the land of Canaan and Palestine. Now, one footnote here that I'm not going to develop any further. The word Palestine is a corruption, sort of, of the word for the Philistines. And so the word Palestine is preserving the Philistine occupation and presence as they have emerged at the beginning of the uh, 12th century B.C. It's sort of ironical that the Philistines aren't the ones that live there most of the time. The Israelis and ancient Israelites are the ones that have been there longer than anybody, but uh, clearly today the Palestinian issues are, I, I'm not going to go into the politics of all of that, it's just too convoluted and I cannot solve it and someone else is going to have to do that. Uh, so again, the division is usually at Mount Hermon, which is about 9,500 9, foot elevation. It's possible, by the way, I've been told this, I've never done it, to go at certain times of the year snow skiing at Mount Hermon up here and uh, then get in your car after you've done snow skiing and drive all the way down to the Gulf of Elat and go snorkeling in the afternoon. A uh, bit of a long trip, I might add. And with the traffic of the Israelis on the road, I wouldn't really advise it, but uh, they say it can be done. Uh, probably is something I'll never accomplish, partly because I don't snow ski, so I'll leave that alone. Now, the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine, is the area where the Israelites, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites all tend to develop, almost simultaneously. And this is going to create some of the uh, turmoil that occurs. Now, admittedly, there's some debate about the Edomites and Ammonites and Moabites. There's even some debate about whether the Israelites are there at this point in around the 13th century B.C. But uh, at least from the standpoint of the narrative of the Bible, uh, the Bible will talk in terms of the Israelites and the Philistines arriving about the same time and the conflicts that are going to ensue. The Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites appear a little bit later generally, at least as relatively major civilizations, even though the children of Israel will encounter them on their sojourn to the promised land. The coastline itself has very few natural harbors, and this has created a bit of a challenge for the people of the ancient world. The major harbors for the area that we would consider would be at Joppa, which, by the way, is also referred to in some of the Greek myths, uh, Harbor at Joppa. Then there would be one up here at Akko, and then there are some that are a little more prevalent on up the way. There's one also at Dor, but none of these are really ideal kind of ports, nothing like characterized Ephesus and so forth in, the, in Turkey and later areas. Now, Herod the Great is going to come along, and he's going to develop a very, very significant uh, harbor at Caesarea Maritima. But for Old Testament studies, uh, that harbor is irrelevant because it just doesn't exist as far as the Old Testament narrative is concerned. You might remember uh, in the construction of the temple, uh, Solomon will have cedars of Lebanon floated down along the coast that come to Joppa where they are then dismantled and then carried from Joppa into Jerusalem where the temple is going to be constructed. So Joppa comes in as sort of a port along the line there, and you can visit that even today. It's really rather interesting. The land of Canaan is a rather fractured geography. I mean, very badly so. Part of that, of course, is just geologic issues. And because of its fractured geography, and we're going to survey this here in a moment, uh, going from west to east, the terrain is really uh, ruptured in a lot of ways, and it's difficult to make the trip especially in the ancient times. Now, when I say difficult, I'm not suggesting it was impossible, but it wasn't something that you would just casually, okay, I think I'm going to make a trip to Jerusalem today from Joppa. Uh, it's a lot of uphill, downhill kind of climb and descent and so forth in order to get there. 
And because of the fractured nature of the geography, it has been difficult historically, politically, to bring all of this into one unified political entity. Now, it is interesting that the Egyptians have some political control here, but there is no relatively indigenous political unification that exists in the land of Canaan until the Israelites arrive. And prior to that, it was at best uh, foreign control of the area, only primarily to control the passage through the, through the territory. But they weren't particularly concerned about settlements or occupation in any kind of exploitive way. It was more because of the trade patterns connected from Egypt going up into Mesopotamia. But the only really indigenous, and some would question whether the, indigen whether the Israelites are indigenous or not, but the, only, the earliest indigenous population of political unity is with the Israelites. And I think, I think that's really rather striking. Uh, there may be something more dynamic in that than simply uh, just reading a historical account. Now, the word Canaan itself probably, and I emphasize, I, notice I say probably, probably means land of purple. It has nothing to do with the one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater if you uh, remember that song at all. You know, the one-eyed, one-horned, flying, purple people eater. Any of you remember that? Uh, this is not related to them. Okay. <laughs> Just, uh, but the idea probably has to do with uh, the harvesting of murex shellfish that then serve as the source of dye production. Now, there is at Dor a very significant dye production facility dating from about the 6th century BC. Uh, and it's really hard to follow this. Uh, most people, very few people ever really go there as far as tourists are concerned. But naturally, with my sojourning and traveling in the land of Israel, I go to all those little weird places and so forth. And what you have in this photograph is part of a soaking basin that would be, you know, they put the dye in there and the vessels and all that, uh, the, the material to dye and all that, and then you have some drainage channels. And of course, you have to infer this is fairly badly eroded, but you can see some of the drainage channels running through here, another uh, basin and so forth. It would be intriguing to know what the superstructure of all of this looked like. Uh, here, here's what that basin, I think it is, as we look up there, that's carved into this uh, coastal stone. I'm not sure how all of this worked. Uh, I don't know the mechanics of it, but uh, the seashell under consideration, that's a photograph of it. I happen to bring in a sample of one of them. I'll pass it around so you can have a look at it. And these are not very large. The, you know, the, the length of that that the gentleman is holding is about, what, two inches maybe or so, two and a half. The estimate is that it takes about 8,000 of these shellfish to produce one cubic centimeter of dye. Now, if you're metrically challenged, a centimeter, it takes 2.56 centimeters to make an inch. Okay, so if you think in terms of a cubic centimeter, you're talking about a volume that is smaller than most of our, you know, monopoly dice and so forth that most of us would play with. And to take 8,000 of these little critters to get the dye sack out of this to produce one cubic centimeter of dye should impress you with why purple stuff in the ancient world was so valuable. And hence, you know, the New Testament, of course, we'll talk about Lydia being a seller in purple. And this is one of the reasons why people infer she was fairly well to do. Now, I don't know many diamond, you know, jewelry owners but the mere fact that a person owns a jewelry store and operates with diamonds and so forth and gold, generally they're better off than I am, okay, uh, economically. And so I think it's usually a fair inference that uh, Lydia would have been rather well to do. Now, mind you, in the ancient world there were two basic sources of purple production. One was the murex shellfish and the other was a plant derivative. And the plant derivative, though, was not near as durable, not near as brilliant in color, than the murex shellfish. It, probably when they would first dye the, vest, the, the material, I have a hunch that most people would not be able to tell the difference. But it's one of those classic cases, you take it home, you wash it a few times, and it's going to fade on you if it's the cheap stuff. Uh, it's sort of like look, looking at a zirconium diamond as opposed to, or zirconium whatever, I shouldn't call it a diamond, 
and looking at a diamond. You know, they look, they, to the naked eye, they would probably look uh, the same. But over time, one of them maybe scratch a little bit and chip and so forth, whereas the diamond's not going to. Maybe that's not the best analogy, but at least it says something. But uh, the other argument for the name Canaan being land of purple is suggested to apply to looking at the western sunset and the purple hue of the sky. Uh, personally, I'm much more inclined to think that it has to do with the dye production, uh, set certainly with the wealth that is involved and implied in all of that. Now, one of the things that's critically important as we think in terms of the geography here is to recognize that this is not a big country. It's not a big territory. I have a map of uh, the land of Palestine here, okay, the land of Canaan. And to give you some point of comparison, uh, if you live in the United States, now I've never been up in this part of the world, uh, but if you would, were to take this from Dan to Beersheba, okay, and compress it someplace into the equivalent distance of the United States, it would be roughly Vermont. Now, you know, if you live in Texas, your point of reference is all messed up. <laughs> if you live in Tennessee, it's all messed up. If you live in Arkansas, it's all messed up. If you think in terms of the land of Canaan and Palestine being roughly equivalent to one of the states in the United States, you have to think in terms of perhaps Vermont. And even from Dan to Beersheba would be slightly shorter than Vermont. So we're not looking at a big country here. The distance actually from uh, Dan, which would be roughly where the arrow ends, over directly to the coast is about 25 miles. If you come down here to Beersheba, where Beersheba would be situated, and go from the Dead Sea over to the coast, it's about 75 miles. That's how small this country is. And one might ask, why in the world would the Lord go to the trouble to give his people this little tiny plot of ground? I'm still convinced that the reason is it isn't so much the natural resources that are important because they're really relatively are not a whole lot. The issue is where it is because God wants to have a location where his people will be able to disseminate the ideas as the traffic goes traveling back and through this area. And of course, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, remember Galatians will talk about, you know, at the appropriate time, you know, when that God sent his son, okay. The issue is that Jesus comes into the world at a time when the Romans are able to disperse the ideas all over, but it's from this little neck of land where people would travel through from Africa to Asia to Europe, from which then the ideas of the gospel then disseminate in all directions. And I can't help but think that in the fullness of time is the phrase, as I'm remembering out of Galatians, that this is critically important. It's in the fullness of time, at the right place, the right time, then the ideas are there. But God is going to begin in the Old Testament to put his chosen people here to at least sort of sow the seed in the same ideas that will become critically important in the dissemination of this message that is so critical. Now, again, the distance in this case from Dan in the north up here to Beersheba is about 150 miles as a crow flies. Now, obviously, you're not going to make this trip as a crow flies flying or otherwise. But uh, if you just went a straight line from Dan to Beersheba, it would be about 150 miles. But one of the things that's critically important, not only is to look at the events in the Bible and think in terms of them as how far is it from point A to point B. See, you and I can do that easily enough, but we have a second step of the, the reality to engage here. And it's not just how far is it from here to somewhere else. The second question is, how long did it take them to make the trip? See, you and I can hop in our vehicles from Searcy, Arkansas, and drive to Little Rock in less than an hour. I say the distance from here to Little Rock is 50 miles. Depends on where you go in Little Rock, of course. But 50 miles is a round number. You, I, you and I can make it very easily in less than an hour, assuming the traffic doesn't get snarled in North Little Rock. But not so in the ancient world. In the ancient world, it would have been at minimum a two and a half day trip one way. And this changes the whole dynamic. It isn't enough just to think in terms of the distance. It's critically important to think in terms of how much time did it take for them to make the trip. 
The typical maximum, I want to emphasize the word maximum here, the typical maximum rate of travel in the ancient world was about 20 miles a day, and you would not be able to do that for very many days in succession. And if you had a lot of sheep and goat or so forth that you're traveling with you, it would just slow you down all the more. Then if you think in terms of the fractured geography, you've got to go over this hill, so find a way up, and find a route down. You don't normally go straight up a hill and straight down the other side, so you're looking for zigzags and everything, and so the whole thing gets complicated even further. But just for the sake of a calculation, straight as a crow flies kind of thing, the distance from Dan to Beersheba would be about a seven and a half day trip, maximum 20 mile a day, which I don't think you'd do. You might get into the second day and think, man, I'm too tired to make that trip on the third day. Let's just stay here overnight and you know, camp a day and rest. This, this is critically important in thinking about this geography of ancient Israel. So when we talk about the children of Israel you know, and, and the kings of Israel making these trips back and forth, you have to factor the time involved in making the trip. And do not escape that calculation because often it plays some really significant implications in narrations that we find in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Now here's a topographic map of sorts that shows sort of the fractured view. Now admittedly the verticals are a bit exaggerated here but we're looking at the coastal plain then the Shephelah down here and the central hills that extend basically as sort of the spine backbone going up along the way and then there is the uh, Jordanian Rift, which is basically a huge earthquake fault. And then you have the Transjordanian Plateau drifting off then into the Arabian Desert further to the east. Now we're going to look at each of these zones in sequence and look at some of the features characteristic of them. First we're going to consider the coastal plain. A coastal plain and the Shephelah, and then we're going to look at the central hills the Jordan Rift, sometimes referred to as the Arava. The Bible will often use the term Arava to refer to the Jordan Rift. And then we'll look briefly, well, probably not much, at the Transjordanian Plateau. So the first category, oh, by the way, one of the things that's critical here is the transecting valley of the Jezreel that cuts across here. And it's the only easy route from the coast to the Jordan Valley that does not go over a high elevation. And this area then becomes critically important in regards to some political control in the ancient world. As people would control this area, they would be controlling the traffic, traveling up through the south, going northward, or going to the inward, uh, inward on over into Mesopotamia and so forth. So this becomes a scene ultimately of dozens of battles throughout history. Even the Bible will narrate a number of battles that take place here. Uh, and, you know, the battle of Deborah and G Barak occur up in this area. The battle with Gideon and the Midianites is in this area. Uh, Jehoram and Ahaziah are in conflict with the Syrians and Jehu in this area. And you're going to have Jer uh, Josiah dies and is wounded in a battle up in this vicinity as he tries to run interference with the Egyptians going northward. And over and over and over, there are battles that are described in the area. And it serves as a wonderful template, ideological template, for the concept of Armageddon that alludes to the mountain of Megiddo, which would be situated just about right there. And so when John, in the Revelation, sees this conflict, he describes it as the battle that occurs at the mountain of Megiddo, at Armageddon, because this area has been replete with battles and wars and conflict all over the place. Now, admittedly, one can argue, is the Armageddon the literal conflict or is it an ideological one? I'm going to leave that alone for the theologians. But certainly, the concept is, is appropriate to use as a template. And that is the significance of that imagery that the Lord chooses to use through John. Now, the coastal plain is, as you would infer by the terminology, is the plain that is along the coast. It is generally quite flat. In ancient times, it was rather marshy right along the coast. And hence, for the most part, people didn't live right on the ocean. 
They tended to live rather inland, but there would be occasional dry areas that would extend out into the coast, and they might move further close to the ocean itself. But for the most part, the occupation was further inland, out of the marshy area, and it's also along roughly where our red line is here that the road in the ancient world would have traveled, sort of away from uh, the marshes before you get into the hilly terrain. And relatively speaking, this whole area is rather flat until you get up to the Carmel Range, which breaks this. There's a little pass that extends around this, the snout, if you will, of the Carmel Range, but it's very dangerous. And every pass through the Carmel Range in and of itself is dangerous, at least as far as uh, invaders or uh, ambush or anything like that. And so the Jezreel Valley, or at least the Carmel Range by the Jezreel Valley, is, an, is a dangerous area to intrude in. And even today, the passes with the four-lane highways will inevitably have to cut into part of the terrain in order to put a four-lane highway running through here. It's really graphic to come through this and see these mountains coming down in this and think in terms of armies in the ancient world came into this. Now, there's a narration in the book of, uh, or excuse me, in most of the thirds narrations where he's talking about contemplating this battle with the Canaanite coalition, and they're concerned about being compressed in the past, coming in both at Yachnium and at Megiddo and at Ta'anak. And he finally decides, I'm going to go the one by Megiddo. But as you travel through here, you can think in terms of, boy, it would have been dangerous to bring an army through this because it would be so easy for the defenders to attack from the higher elevations. But this is part of the geography concern. And again, as Whoever controls the Jezreel Valley is controlling essentially the passes that go through the Carmel Range. So the coastal plain is fractured and broken by the Carmel Range, and then it continues again up in the north as you get beyond that. Now, this is a view of the coastal plain, but obviously that's not flat. <laughs> this is a classic tell. It is an archaeological accumulation that has developed over time, rising above the elevation of the area. The terrain around it is the plain. And on top of that, here is a friend of mine. Notice how flat that is. It's sort of like Kansas. If you've ever been to Kansas, driven across Kansas, talk about a boring state to drive through, sorry. Uh, flat as it can be. Uh, it's interesting to go from Colorado, Denver, and drive through Kansas coming this direction. The high elevation is right at the border of Kansas and Colorado. <laughs> it's, and you're going downhill all the rest of the way till you finally get to Kansas City. And uh, it's just flat. It's just a gentle slope downward. Well, that's sort of what the coastal plain is. It's flat. There's nothing really significant there as far as features to break this up. It's not particularly fertile because of the marshes in the ancient world. And the people in the ancient world didn't retrieve the marshes very readily because they had other resources slightly to the east that they could tap into. But this is the coastal plain, and it sort of characterizes the whole region. Now, this is the plain up at Akko, north of the Carmel Ridge. I'm taking this photograph from the Haifa University looking down on the plain. And it... Sorry, it's sort of hazy. I don't, it's sort of hard to get a real clear picture here because weather doesn't always cooperate with you. But this is a rather also marshy region. And, uh, but there's a port that is over there on the far edge of this at Akko that serves as one of the important ports in the ancient world. Uh, today it's not a port. Haifa is the port, but it's sort of artificially constructed. The next area is the Shefela which is sort of a teardrop-shaped terrain down on the southern part of the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. This area is really nice. Uh, it's a nice place to live, although fortunately there aren't a lot of people living here, uh, even today. But part of the reason I think there aren't a lot of people living there today is because it's such a valuable agricultural region. Now eventually the Philistines, you might recall, are going to come in and they're settled along in the coastal plain. The Israelites are going to eventually settle initially in the hill country. And if you think in terms of the Philistines and the Israelites, notice where the area that is between them. It's the Shephelah. And this is where the battles between the Israelites and the Philistines tend generally to concentrate. They're trying to take over this little territory of the Shephelah, the low rolling hills that are very productive. 
If you travel there today, here are wheat fields that have been under cultivation. This was just a few years ago, a Bedouin camp that is there where the guy has been working and harvesting the grain. You can go here and watch sheep grazing all over the place. There are low rolling hills with forests on them. Uh, this is a little more uh, hilly, but it's still the inner edge of the Shefela just before you start hitting the, the mountain areas. Uh, this, by the way, is the Valley of Elah, which is where the battle between David and Goliath takes place. Uh, probably just around the curve there, uh, you can stop at the brook and pick up your five smooth stones and pretend that somebody is a giant. And I wouldn't recommend slinging it at them because most people can't sling a stone very well. It's not real easy. I've tried. If, you're, if somebody tries that, get out of the way because you don't know where the stone's going to go. But people who know how to do it, the Bible will describe uh, the Benjaminites who could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not myths. Scientific uh, footnote here, this is not part of the geography, but Scientific American a number of years ago, about late 60s, had an article on sling throwers in the ancient world. And they did a lot of studies and anthropological studies, and sling throwers can throw a stone up to and over 200 yards at speeds of 90 miles an hour plus. And we're talking about stones that are about the size of golf ball, or no, about the size of tennis balls. If you get hit with one of those, you're done. When the Bible describes a stone hit Goliath's head and sank into his forehead, I can believe it. And I'm not going to argue about what killed him. Was it the stone or David Cop chopping his head off? It's fundamentally irrelevant. But uh, that battle takes place in this vicinity. And it's really exciting to go there and visit. Come with me sometime. Uh, we excavate not too far from here. Matter of fact, this is where we excavate, just north of there. This is the Sorek Valley. Uh, the coast would be over that direction. This is part of the Shefela again, but it's sort of getting the northern area. But this is the hill that is just north of us. Again, it's a fairly low hill, nothing significant. Zora, which is the home of Samson, is right there. I'm standing on Bet Shemesh looking across the way. And if you remember the story of the Bible uh, in, the, in the Old Testament where the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and then they keep it in their custody and it transports around to various towns and all kinds of problems occur and all of that. And they eventually are going to ship it from Ekron back into Israelite territory. There's a ridge right over there just beyond which is Ekron. And... We have, we have arrived every year, we arrive just at the time that wheat harvest has ended. And the Bible will talk in terms of the Ark of the Covenant coming up the valley and the people at Bet Shemesh, which would be here, see them at the time of wheat harvest and they become exultant over the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant and they're going to you know, break up the cart and all of that, use the animals as the offering and then they get too excited and look into the Ark of the Covenant and they're in trouble. Uh, so they ship the Ark of the Covenant off to Kiriath-Jerim, where basically it stays until David is going to facilitate its arrival into Jerusalem. But all of that takes place in this vicinity, in the northern part of the Shephela. But it's interesting that the conflict is with the Philistines on the other side of the ridge over there and the Israelites at Bet Shemesh. It's also the scene just over the ridge there is Timnah. And you might recall Timnah is where Samson, who lives here, goes to Timnah, to find that woman who he wants to be his first wife. But you might recall that never actually occurred because of, oh, let's just say complications. And uh, leave it at that. But this is the terrain where all of those events take place. We move down to the central hills, and you're going to see that these are immediately more rugged. And one of the things I want to point out, uh, Bet Shemesh is situated uh, roughly here. Okay, If you drive along the road, <laughs> great. <laughs> Sharon, get off my thing here. Okay, that's my wife. <laughs> She's online. Uh, if you drive along the road here that uh, runs roughly where this uh, yellow into the sort of whatever color that is, you can see immediately, if you're driving northward, on one side the hills are low. I mean, you can tell they're hills, of course, but they're rather low. But the ones to the east are suddenly projecting up steep. They're not real high, but they're rugged. And that's part of the central hills that comes into play here. And the, the difference is dramatic. Now, the last photograph that I showed you, last photograph I showed you was the Shefela at Bet Shemesh. This is just a 
couple three miles east of Bet Shemesh. And notice the declivities and the steepness of this. And trying, think in terms of trying to go from east to west and bringing armies through all of this. And, of course, the vulnerability, the logistical problems that would ensue, and so forth. We're actually on the way in this photograph from Bet Shemesh to Jerusalem. And the dramatic shift in the topography is just overwhelming. I used to, uh, now, you know, newer vehicles are, you know, fuel injected and all that kind of thing, and they run better. I used to have rent a car that was just regularly aspirated, as they call it, you know, just regular carburetor. And I would always have to shift down into second and third to get up these hills and so forth. Uh, and it will just lug everything down. It's, it's just steep. It's not high, but it's steep, and it's difficult. And this is part of what the Central Hills is. This is, where, this is the area where the children of Israel are initially going to settle, and from which they're going to rally their forces then to fight against the Philistines, fighting over the Shephelah. And I can't help but some of, think that some of the reason for the battle between the Israelites and the Philistines is the potential uh, agricultural resources that would be available in the Shephela that are otherwise a bit difficult in the Central Hills. Now, this is another view coming into Jerusalem. You notice these are not just general rolling hills. Uh, these are significantly more steep and precipitous as you make the trip. And there are several ridges that you cross going typically in the route from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem. You go up a slope and then down a valley, up another slope, which is higher, and then down into Second Valley. And finally, you go up a third slope before you get to Jerusalem. So it's sort of a seesaw effect as you're making the trip. And I can easily imagine, I, to me, this makes perfect sense why Sennacherib in uh, the 8th century doesn't want to take his army to Jerusalem. You know, try and scare them into surrender. Uh, and conquering all of the surrounding areas. The central hills largely are the same all the way up through here. Very precipitous, very rugged, uh, difficult to negotiate. Good places to hide out in, generally, if you have to run away from somebody. The, centra, uh, the Jordan Rift is an earthquake fault. I mean, that's it. Uh, this is why it's below sea level. The below sea level begins actually about right there. As you're coming southward, it begins about there, north of, the dead, north of the Sea of Galilee, and it is below sea level all the way off to the bottom, off of this slide. And the Sea of Galilee is about 650 feet below sea level, the, the surface of the water. The surface of the water of the Dead Sea is about 1,300 feet below sea level and dropping in modern times. The Dead Sea doesn't look like this anymore. Matter of fact, the Dead Sea is shrinking significantly by almost a meter of water a year, which is sort of frightening and the implications of that. But the Dead Sea now ends roughly right here. Now there is some water down here, but they have to pump it down there. Uh, but the natural stop of the land is just about, or of the water is just about in that area itself. And, uh, but it's really a fascinating place to visit. We're going to start our tour of this up here near Mount Hermon. And then we're going to travel southward. Uh, you can't see this real well, but Mount Hermon is snow-capped off in the horizon there. And again, it's about 9,500 foot elevation, depending on the amount of, now it's, Svee Letterman is online, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's snow-capped, depending on the amount of rain that occurs, sometimes it's snow-capped all year round. But that, in and of itself, should give you some impression of the water resources, of the weather that is up there. Now, as the water and the snow will melt, you certainly can think in terms of some significant water resources. And here is one of them. There are three major sources of the Jordan River. And we're going to look at two of them. This one is the spring that is near the site of Dan. Now you may remember from Dan to Beersheba, this is there. It's really spooky to stand here. Now notice the sign says there are 240 million cubic meters of water coming out of the spring a year. Now that's a lot of water. That's well over a trillion gallons of water a year. Now that doesn't mean a lot to me, but we hear a lot of trillion tossed around in our world today economically. But
this is what we're talking about. This is a lot of water. This is the largest karstic spring in the Middle East. One of the reasons why the area is under dispute even today between the Syrians and Lebanese and the Israelis. But if you were to come and stand right here, the water here is not going that direction. The water is going this direction, out from under you. It is a weird feeling. I mean, you don't feel anything. But if you think in terms of the water coming out this direction and then turning to go downstream, you, you look at this and you think it ought to be flowing this direction. No, it's coming out from underneath your feet. Just gushing out like that. This is a little bit downstream from there. I mean, just cascading down. Cold, fresh, pure mountain snow melt. I've excavated at Dan a number of years ago, and we have to drink water a lot because you dehydrate the dry weather and the hot weather and everything else. And we would take our, we wouldn't fill up our canteens at the hotel. We would come to here and fill them up at the spring, this water that's about 35 degrees and just as pure as it could be. Incredible. Great stuff. And, uh, it, it, it was really exciting to be able to work there. But this is one of the sources of the Jordan River. The other source is just about a mile and a half, two miles away. This is the site of Caesarea Philippi, mentioned, of course, in the New Testament in association with Jesus and Paul's, or Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16. Uh, this is the source from which the spring comes. In ancient times, it was dedicated to Pan, the god of the forest, the goat god of the forest. And during the time of Herod, this became developed in particular as a worship shrine. I won't show you all of those, but as you approach the site, again, here is the water coming out of this huge array of lush vegetation. And it's just coming out of the ground and starting to flow down the way. And then eventually, just slightly down the way, you have these beautiful waterfalls. And you can come and visit this in August, and the water is still just cascading down. Now, it'll fluctuate. If you go there in uh, February, I've been there in February, and the mist is just misting up all over the place. Sort of like going to Niagara Falls, if you've ever been there. The water going over and all of it crashing up. But in the summertime, it's a little less dramatic, but still, it's very serene, cool. But notice the vegetation. The vegetation here is all natural. Be honest with you, I can understand why the Danites would say, let's go move to Dan. You know, all of this water and everything so easily available. Uh, it's a wonderful area to live, uh, at least would have been if it weren't for all the political turmoil that goes on between the modern Syrians and Lebanese and Israelis. Now, as we move southward, this is the Valley of Hula. Uh, this is between the two springs that we've just looked at and the Sea of Galilee. Notice the lushness of this. This used to be a marsh area. The Israelis have reclaimed it to be agricultural land. But there still would have been area that could have been uh, put under agriculture and cultivation even in the ancient world. But a lot of natural resources, the water resources from the Jordan as it would be flowing through here, they could tap into at least to a certain degree. Uh, rainfall is plentiful enough that you can grow crops quite easily. Now, as we go further south, we're approaching the Sea of Galilee. This is my wife, who was online a moment ago. Now she's on screen. Uh, we're walking down the way. This is the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this is an area that has an extended growing season because of the lower elevation. The temperatures remain warmer longer. Uh, it also has very, very rich soil because it's a volcanic, and hence a very rich, nutrient-laden soil. And so it was an area that was very valuable in the ancient world for agricultural pursuits and so forth. Now, here is another photograph. We're looking, this is from our hotel room, and we're looking, this by the way, this, uh, something that's important. This, is, this actually is taken in uh, late fall, but this is roughly the way it looked in, looks in March, a uh, little greener than this, but roughly this way in March. This is a photograph in March. And we're looking southward. Uh, the hills of Jordan are there. This is the Golan Heights. There's a valley that cuts through there that is the shadow that you might be able to see. 
And then the water of the Galilee is going to flow out in the south end and, of course, continue toward the Dead Sea. But uh, on a clear day, it is really, really beautiful. And uh, you can certainly understand and appreciate the agricultural value of the region. Now, this is the next day after the last photograph. We're traveling southward, going along the Jordan Valley. And one of the things you're going to notice is it will go from this green grass in the field with the sheep that are out there grazing and so forth. And this is a little bit further south. The grass is still here, but you'll notice there's less down there. That is Tel Sabia down in the Jordan Valley. It's a classic tell shape that characterizes most archaeological sites in this part of the world. And then we continue southward to Jericho. Same day, by the way. Now notice how much more barren it is. Now as you have traveled southward, you've gone from lush green Galilee to a eh, nice grazing area along the mid-valley, and then you get down here and you wonder, where did everything go? This is the same day. Now, now, admittedly, in the ancient world, they wouldn't have done it in one day. But still, this is less, in less than half a day, I might add. We're looking at maybe uh, 80, 90 miles or so in this trip. And such a dramatic change in topography and particularly wealth of resources as far as uh, grazing and so forth and agriculture. Uh, Jericho is right off to the right on this. And... Beyond the, actually, that is part of Jordan off on the horizon. So what, what I want you to see here is the people of Jericho would have been able to see the Israelites on the other side of the Jordan River camped out. You know, as long as they're at Shittim, the people of Jericho would have been able to see them across the way, which had to be a bit of an intimidating factor. Uh, thinking and knowing what the Israelites had done to the kings of Sihon and Og on the other side and to realize we're in their sights next. And so this, this has to be an intimidating point. And Rahab, of course, alludes to some of this when she talks to the spies. Now, we move further south. This is along the Dead Sea. This is the Dead Sea in the horizon, the hills of Moab off in the distance. And this is a Chalcolithic temple dating from about 4200 B.C. And it was found on some survey work. Uh, it's been excavated and cleaned out and so forth and reconstructed somewhat but along the lines of the wall stubs that were there. My wife is standing right there. You can see her, and you can get some idea then of the size of the complex itself. But what's interesting here, obviously this is extremely barren. You know, there, isn't, there aren't a lot of uh, plants in the area of any kind. Okay, this is desolate region. One of the questions that arises is why is this temple here? Regretfully, we don't know for sure. They weren't writing in 4200 B.C., at least as far as we're aware. Okay, and so the postulate is that this temple is here because of two water resources. Okay, there's a gateway right there that heads off this direction. You see the trees down here? There's a spring there. There's a natural spring there, fresh water. And then there's a door that cuts off this direction and goes down the slope there to another spring. Fresh water just comes straight out of the side of the hill. And the postulate is that this temple out here in the middle of absolutely nowhere is here because of these freshwater resources, which makes sense. If you think in terms of the mystery of the mind of the antiquity, you know, there must be a god here to give water in such a desolate region. This is the idea. This is the anthropological concept that comes into play. Now, nearby down in this valley is this vegetation. This is the area of, in, uh, not in Rogel, this is the area of uh, En Gedi, where David goes to hide from Saul. And he's in a cave along this way. And Saul will go in to uh, relieve himself, okay. And David's going to cut off the part of the skirt, uh, hem of his garment. It's in this vicinity where that narration unfolds. And if you go there and visit, you can recognize, boy, it'd be easy to hide from somebody in this mess. Because to search through all of this and find anybody would have been a real chore. And David, of course, and some of his men are hidden in this cave, and Saul arrives on the scene. Now, this is a friend of mine washing his face at the spring that's just down the slope, the water that just flows out of the side of the hill. And boy, I tell you, on a nice, hot July day, uh, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon in Israel with a temperature of about 110. Oh, it feels good. 
so refreshing. And that's what you partly have to think in terms of. In the summertime, the temperature, these don't, people don't have air conditioning. Okay, so they're down here in this hot, 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 arid region, and this refreshing water that miraculously is here. Now, they can't drink that. If they drink that, it'll kill them. Not because it's poisonous per se, but because there are so many minerals and stuff in it that it will kill them. It's not poison in the sense that we think it, it's just the volume of all of the minerals. Matter of fact, you go to the Dead Sea today and there are signs around it that say, uh, you know, don't drink this and if you do, here's the poison center to call. Here's the other spring that uh, is right down here where, again, my friend is standing and the water just coming here. I've been here in the after, late afternoon and ibexes are coming and drinking water at the spring. Really, really neat. These wild animals will come in the late afternoon and get their water and then scurry back off into the, uh, into the hills. Now, here's my friend floating in the Dead Sea. It's so full of minerals and everything, salts, that you're so buoyant. He has no floater tubes or anything on him. He's just lying back in the water. And you get out and you have this sort of oily crystalline film on you after it dries for a while. It looks like somebody took a little really, you, you've seen the girls with the, the young ladies with the makeup that has glitter, you know, it looks like that. You know, it looks like somebody took that, you sort of threw it all over you and you've got this all over you till you wash it off. Uh, in this photograph, he is not standing on anything. Feet are straight down, not touching the floor, but notice how high he is floating. I mean, it is really freaky to go there. Nothing grows there. Nothing lives there. They have found some micro, bi, you know, micro thingy that grows in the Dead Sea, but you know, it's useless. Can't do anything with it. But uh, it's, it's a strange, strange experience. Here's some salt that has crystallized around. Somehow, I don't know what kind of plant this is, but uh, somehow this has crystallized around the stem of the plant. And you can find these salt blocks, essentially, especially along the southern part of the water where it has been a little more dormant. Uh, for instance, here is, here's a mushroom sort of of a salt accumulation in the southern end of the Dead Sea. Further south, this is near the Gulf of Elat. Okay, the Gulf of Elat is in the vicinity where the children of Israel cross from the Sinai Peninsula into Edom. What I want you to think in terms of as you look at this, this is the kind of geography and topography that the children of Israel wandered in for 40 years. That's it. Almost everywhere you go in the Sinai Peninsula looks like that. There'll be some variations, but with the exception of the occasional oasis, this is what you're walking through. I hate to say this, but I can sort of understand why the Israelites would whine, <laughs> especially after years of this. Now, if I'd, I hope that if I had lived then and experienced the miracles God performed, I would be less inclined to whine. But at least as a mere human being, I can sort of see if you're stuck out here and can't get away, then uh, the problems that would ensue. And that's our brief survey of the land of Canaan. Any questions, comments? I hope it gives some insight as to what all was going on and kind of world in which ancient Israel and Jesus lived didn't deal much with Transjordan. It doesn't change a lot if you look at the same horizontal connections until, you, of course, you get out in the desert and then it just becomes desert. But anyway, thank you for your time. Yeah, oh, question. Uh, from Ur, I don't know for sure, but the calculation roughly... Uh, from Haran, which is the last major place he was when the Lord came to him again to leave. Uh, from Haran into, say, uh, let's say Bethel, would have been about 500 miles. 
And there's no way in the world Abraham with his entourage would have done 20 miles a day, at least without supernatural intervention. <laughs> there's no reason to assume he has supernatural intervention. So, but just on the rule of thumb, five, uh, you know, 20 miles a day, you're looking at 25 days breakneck speed to make the trip. But more likely, it would have been two or three months. And that's just from Haran. Now, there is a break. He's, he's summoned from Ur, assuming Ur is down near the, uh, the Persian Gulf, which I think it was. There is some argument about where that was. But if it is from the, near the Persian Gulf to Haran, you're looking at slightly over double the entire distance. But the summons from Ur to Haran is one leg. And then when he gets to Haran, you remember his, his father stays there. And it takes apparently a little while for the Lord to come back and summon Abraham to leave that. So there are a few years, apparently, that he lives in Haran before the second step of the journey occurs. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you.